Uh, now that we've gone through all the mole calculations and we've gone through what the parts of the atom are, we're going to start looking at how the parts are arranged and get into atomic structure, and this will lead us into a lot of properties stuff. So I'm breaking atomic structure up into two uh, different PowerPoints. This one will get us partway, and then the next one will get us all the way through homework six. Partway through the next series of slides, the ones after this, you'll be able to do homework five. This may be broken up into one video or two, but let's just see how it goes. All right, so let's pick up where we left off on structure. So if you remember, we had determined that an atom is made of, remember, first of all, an atom is the smallest piece of an element that is still that element. So even though electrons are very small, they're no longer the element. So right now we have atoms made of protons, neutrons, and electrons with their masses here. Electrons' mass is very small. Protons have a charge of 1, neutrons a charge of 0, electrons have a charge of negative 1. We also know that matter is stable and that there's the same number of protons and electrons because atoms are uncharged. All right, so this is what we know walking in the door. Another piece of information that's extremely important in chemistry is charge-charge interactions. This is referred to as Coulomb's Law. And some of this you actually knew, um, but you didn't know it was called this. And um, we're not going to ever do the math with this, but just understanding how charges interact is extremely important. So if you look at the equation on the, on the right, F is the force between charges. Okay, a force is a push or a pull. K is a constant. I'd have to look it up. Q1 and Q2, I don't know why we use Q, but those are the charges. And this, this applies to any charges, so this could be plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 5, minus 5, minus 2. It doesn't matter. Any charges. And R is the distance between the charges. All right, so if you look at this equation, um, first of all, what it tells us is if the charges get bigger, then the force between them, whether attractive or repulsive, the force will get bigger. The bigger the charges, the bigger the number. But let's back up one step before I do that. Right now, the other thing is if you think about it, if the charges are of the same sign, both plus, the force will be positive. Both minus, the force will be positive. If the charges are of opposite sign, however, then the force will be negative. Now, if a force is a push or a pull, how can it be negative? So the concept of negative, and I th think I talked about this before, that negative in the math, you know, when, they, when you learn about negatives in math, they taught you on a number line, and it's a direction. So 1 and negative 1 are the same value, but they're different directions. So in this case, if the force is a positive number, it's a force of repulsion, pushing away. If the force is a negative number, it's a force of attraction. And you've known, this is the part you knew, alike charges repel, right? And then opposite charges attract. So opposite charges, the ch sign will be negative, right? They attract. And you have everyone says, oh yeah, opposites attract, that when they apply it to relationships. I will tell you this works for charges. It does not work for relationships. I've done the experiment. Anyway. Um, the other part to this, so understanding how charges interact is important. The other part to this is if you look at the math, the bigger the charges, the stronger the force between them. And it doesn't matter if they're positive or negative. If I have a plus 1, plus 1, it's going to repel. If I have a plus 5, plus 3, it's going to repel more. If I have a minus 1, minus 1, it'll, it'll repel, and so on and so forth. If I have a plus 2, minus 2, it'll attract. If I have a plus 3, minus 8, it'll attract even more. So the bigger the charges, the stronger the interaction. So bigger charges attract or repel more. And then R, the distance between them, since it's in the denominator, if the distance between the charges gets bigger, the force actually gets smaller. Uh, some of this stuff is on homework. Most of the stuff is on homework five, but we won't complete the material for homework five on this set of slides. Right? So bigger charges attract or repel more strongly, and further apart, they attract or repel more weakly. And that's going to that's gonna come back a lot in this class and even when you guys go on taking organic chemistry. It's not terribly complicated, but it's really important. All right, so let's pretend for a moment that there's no neutrons, and let's see, you've got positives and negatives, equal amounts. How would you, and forget it, what you've ever been taught about the model of atom, how would you arrange the protons and electrons so it's stable? So I'll give you guys a moment. This is where you can hit pause. All right, did you come up with an idea? Okay, well, this is what J.J. Thompson came up with. The idea is that the positives and negatives are alternating. So you have a sea of positives and negatives in between them. 
This is a very early model of the atom. It's called J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model, and the, suggested that electrons are held in a sphere of positive charge. Right? Now, that's not correct, but it's a good starting point. But this is a good exercise in scientific method as well. So the next thing that happens when you have a hypothesis is you test it. And so Ernest Rutherford tested Thompson's theory. And so he set up this experiment to the right, took a, a source of alpha radiation. So we haven't talked about radiation much, but when atoms fall apart, they spit out, they fall apart in patterns, and they spit out sometimes particles. And one of the particles they can spit out is called an alpha particle. It has this notation. So it's a 4, 2, 2 plus. Basically, it's two protons and two neutrons. Also, when they fall apart, they don't just fall apart, they shoot out these particles. So these alpha particles are coming out at very, very high speed. So bottom line is a beam of positively charged particles coming at very high energy, and this is a thin gold sheet. And then this is a detector. It's a fluorescent screen because you can't see radiation, but when a radioactive particle hits a fluorescent screen, the screen will fluoresce. It'll glow in the dark. And so the way you do this experiment is you make sure it's aimed, and then you turn off the lights and you turn this on, and then somebody had to count all the spots. Kind of an interesting aside, Rutherford didn't actually do the experiment. He had a postdoctoral uh, fellow named Hans Geiger, and Geiger didn't like counting the spots, and so he invented a device to count the spots, and most of you have heard of a Geiger counter. Anyway, so thinking, let's look at what he thought would happen, because when we do, when we test a hypothesis, we're saying, if, the, if what we think is right, if this is what we think is going on, then when we do this, this should happen. So the hypothesis was this, since there's alternating protons and electrons, you would expect the alpha particles to go through, and they would, as they came across a negative, they'd be pulled towards it. As they came across a positive, they'd be pushed away. So you'd expect it to zig and zag and zig and zag, and basically come out undeflected or deflected at small angles, because the charges it would encounter would cancel out. Okay, and this is what we, this is the hypothesis. If the if the model is correct, this is what should happen. All right. Now let's see what really did happen. So this is the actual result, all right? So there's the alpha particles, and you can see most of them did what we thought, but some bounced at large angles, which was un, un, um, unexpected, and some even bounced back. All right, so it's a nice diagram. Your textbook has a picture like this. I forget what page it's on, all right? So here, these are the results, and I'll do the conclusions in a minute. So the results from the diagram, most, not just some, most of those alpha particles were undeflected or deflected at small angles. Okay, not all, but most, which is, that's what we expected. However, some were deflected at large angles, and how many is some? Enough that it's significant, and some bounced back. Now, let's look at the conclusions to this, all right? Let's leave number one alone for a minute. What could cause a beam of positively charged particles to be deflected at a large angle? And the answer is, that there's a concentration of charge. Rutherford referred to it as a nucleus. And it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, but if, a, if positive comes near a big chunk of negative, it'll get pulled around it, kind of like um, you know, a, planet, a planet getting pulled around the sun. It would go zoop like that. All right? If it comes near a big positive, it would get pushed away. So if here's the beam, it would go, and this is the chunk of positive, it would go like that. But there has to be a big chunk of charge because small charges will move it a little bit, big charges will move it a lot. All right, so that's some bounce. This result gave us this conclusion. The fact that some bounce back tells us that the nucleus is positive. So what this means is some of the alpha particles hit the nucleus and therefore, you know, they positive and positive would push each other away. If the nucleus was negative, you would expect some of the alpha particles to not come out. Now, how can you shoot a beam of positively charged particles through a field that's got big chunks of positive, and yet most of them uh, come out at very small angles or, not, or, or aren't bent at all? Look back to here, here, right? Big chunk of positive, right? But the R term, what if it's really far away? And that means the atom is mostly empty space. The reason we say mostly is most of the alpha particles didn't even come close to the nucleus. 
all right? So this says that most alpha particles didn't come close to the nucleus. That means the nuclei must be very, very far apart. And remember, gold is a solid. That means the atoms themselves are very close together. So this is the expected results. This is what actually happened. And this is Rutherford's words down here, right? You expect most of them to go through, but what happened? This is most of them not even coming close, right? This is the sum of them coming close to the nucleus. Okay, being pushed away, and this is the ones that hit, but most of them very far away. So this is Rutherford's conclusion, right? Most of the atoms, nucleus, and all of its positive charge are in the nucleus, most of its mass, excuse me. They didn't know about neutrons. Most of the volume is empty space. Atom is mostly nothing. Just to put it in perspective, the radius of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10th meters. The nucleus, 10 to the minus 15th. So 100,000 times smaller. Um, this part we knew that the net electrons equal to protons. This part isn't Rutherford's part. I threw this in. It was later determined that the neutrons were also in the nucleus. So this is a nice picture. Here's your nucleus. Here's electrons very far away. All right. So this is a summary of Rutherford. And then we'll stop this video and we'll start another video. Let me just make sure. Yeah. All right. So this is Rutherford. And this is correct. This is correct today. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. That means all the mass is in the nucleus, and the nucleus is positively charged. Electrons are very far away. Realize that there's potential energy between the electrons and the nucleus, right? Because the electrons are negative and the nucleus is positive, so they must have enough energy to not crash in. Um, they do not orbit. We'll talk about that later. So what are they doing out there? We'll get to that as well. Additional thoughts? Think, if you think about this from, from the last set of slides, if we change neutrons, not the mole slides, but the atoms, ions, and isotopes, remember if you change the neutrons, the properties don't change. But if you change the electrons, the properties change significantly. Now that makes sense because for atoms to react, they have to bump into each other. When they bump into each other, what's going to hit? It's going to be the outside. Well, what's on the outside? The electrons. So if you change the electrons, that's going to change the properties significantly. So this actually makes a great deal of sense. So I'm going to stop this video here. I'll pick up here. This will be two videos.